Welcome back. Let's practice finding intersections involving lines and planes. All right, so here's our first example. We want to find the point or points of intersection, if any, of the plane and line. If they do intersect, find the angle of intersection. All right, and so we're given the equation of a plane here, 5x plus 3y minus 2z equals 11, and then we're given a set of parametric equations that represent a line. We have x equals t plus 1, y equals 2t, and z equals t minus 3. All right, and so if we want to determine if this line and this plane have any points of intersection, what we have to do is plug in these parametric equations for the line into the plane equation. All right, so what we're going to do is plug t plus 1 in for x in the plane equation, then we'll plug in 2t in for y in the plane equation, and then we'll plug in t minus 3 in for z in the plane equation. And then once we do that, what we want to try to do is solve for that parameter of t, and then we can use that value of t to plug back into our parametric equations to get an x, y, and z coordinate of the point of intersection between this line and this plane. All right, and so let's do that. Let's plug these parametric equations into this plane equation. We'll have 5 times x, but x is going to be t plus 1. So we have 5 times t plus 1. Then we'll have plus 3 times y, but y will be 2t. And so we'll multiply by 2t. And then we'll have minus 2 times z, where z is t minus 3. So we have 2 times t minus 3, and that will be equal to 11. All right, now what we want to do next is simplify this by multiplying 5 by this quantity, 3 by this quantity, and negative 2 by this quantity. All right, and so if we do that, we'll have 5t plus 5 plus 6t minus 2t plus 6, and that will be equal to 11. And so now what we want to do is combine our like terms. We have a bunch of terms with t in them, and then we have some constants that we want to add together as well. And so we have 5t, 6t, and negative 2t. 5t plus 6t is 11t minus 2t will give us 9t, and so we'll have 9t, and then for our constants, we have 5 and 6, and 5 plus 6 is 11, so we have 9t plus 11 is equal to 11. And so now, if we subtract 11 from both sides of the equation, that will give us 9t is equal to 0, and so now, we can solve for t pretty easily. If you divide both sides by 9, you will find that t is equal to 0. And so now we've solved for t, which means that this line and this plane do intersect at a point. In particular, the point on this line where t equals 0. And so let's find that point. What we have to do to find it is plug this value of t that we found into each parametric equation, and then we will get the corresponding x, y, and z coordinates of the point of intersection. So let's do that. For the x coordinate, we'll have x equals 0 plus 1, right? We have t plus 1, and t is 0, so we'll have 0 plus 1, and that's equal to 1. For y, we will have 2 times t, which is 0, and 2 times 0 is 0. And then for z, we have t minus 3, or 0 minus 3, which will be negative 3. All right, and so now we have the x, y, and z coordinate of our point of intersection. They are 1, 0, and negative 3, so the point of intersection will be 1, 0, negative 3. That is the only point of intersection between this line and this plane. Okay, and so we found the point of intersection, but now remember that's not the only thing we wanted to find in this example. There's a second part. We have if they do intersect, meaning the line and the plane, if they do intersect, find the angle of intersection. And so since we were able to find a point of intersection, we know that this line and this plane do intersect, we will be able to find an angle of intersection. And in order to find that angle, we have to know the formula for finding the angle of intersection between a line and a plane. And so it looks like this. The angle of intersection between a line and a plane is equal to 90 degrees minus the inverse cosine function of the absolute value of the dot product between the normal vector of the plane and the direction vector from the line divided by the magnitudes of those vectors multiplied together. 
all right? And if you wanna know where this formula comes from, how we get this formula, be sure to check out my lesson video on this topic if you haven't already seen it, okay? But in this video, we're just gonna focus on using this formula. And so what we have to do to find this angle of intersection is find the normal vector of our plane and the direction vector from our line. And if you're familiar with the equations of planes and lines, finding these two vectors shouldn't be too bad. Remember that a normal vector of a plane will have components that are the coefficients of x, y, and z, right? So the normal vector of this plane will have components of five, three, and negative two, right? Those are the coefficients of x, y, and z, five, three, and negative two. So that's a normal vector for this plane. But then for the direction vector of this line, what we do is we look at the coefficients of the parameter t in each parametric equation. So for the x component, we have one. Then for the y component, we have two. And then for the z component, we have one. All right, so a direction vector for this line would be a vector with components of one, two, one. Okay, and so now we have the two vectors that we need to calculate this angle of intersection between the plane and the line. And so let's set up this formula. The angle of intersection will be equal to 90 degrees minus inverse cosine of this expression. And we're going to be taking the absolute value of the dot product between these two vectors. And so if you remember, the dot product between two vectors is the sum of the product of corresponding components. So we multiply the x components together, add that to multiplying the y components together, and add that to multiplying the z components together. So we'll have five times one plus three times two plus negative two times one. All right, now five times one is five. So we will have five plus three times two, which is six. So we have five plus six plus negative two times one, which is negative two. All right, and you still have absolute value bars around that dot product. Now in the denominator, we're going to have two magnitudes. We'll have the magnitude of vector n multiplied by the magnitude of vector v, or the normal vector's magnitude and the direction vector's magnitude. And remember that the magnitude of a vector is equal to the square root of the sum of their components squared. So for vector n, we'll have five squared plus three squared plus negative two squared. Five squared is 25, 3 squared is 9, and negative 2 squared is 4. So I'm going to do this on the side here. We'll have 25 plus 9 plus 4, and that's going to be under the square root. 25 plus 9 is 34, plus 4 is 38. And so we will have the square root of 38 for the magnitude of vector n, the normal vector. And then for the magnitude of vector v, we'll have 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared underneath this square root and one squared is one, two squared is four, and one squared is one again. So we have one plus four plus one, which is six. So we will have the square root of six as the magnitude of that direction vector, okay? And so now, if we simplify, five plus six is 11 plus negative two will be nine, and the absolute value of nine is just nine because nine is positive, positive. and so this will be equal to 90 degrees minus inverse cosine of nine divided by the square root of 38 times the square root of six, and 38 times six is 228. So we'll have the square root of 228 in the denominator. And I'm not gonna bother to simplify this any further because now what we wanna do is plug this into our calculator. You wanna take the inverse cosine of nine divided by the square root of 228. And if you do that, this will become 90 degrees minus 53.4 degrees, and that will give us a final answer of 36.6 degrees. That is the angle of intersection between this line and this plane, okay? And do note that I did round off those values. That is not an exact answer. I just rounded off to one decimal place to keep things simple, okay? And so now we finished this example. We have found both the point and angle of intersection between this line and this plane. Let's take a look at another example. Okay, so next up we have the same type of problem. We wanna find the point or points of intersection, if any, of the plane and the line. If they do intersect, then we wanna find the angle of intersection. And so this time our plane is negative seven x plus two y plus eight z equals three, and our line is given by this symmetric equation 
where we have x minus 1 divided by 2 is equal to y plus 7 divided by 3 is equal to z minus 3. All right, and so what we want to do to find any points of intersection is plug the parametric equations for the line into the plane equation. But now, as you can see, we don't have a set of parametric equations for this line. And so that seems like an issue at first. But what we can do is find a set of parametric equations for this line from this symmetric equation. In order to find a set of parametric equations, what you have to do is set each part of this symmetric equation equal to a parameter t, right? So we'll have t equals x minus 1 divided by 2, and then t equals y plus 7 divided by 3 and t equals z minus three. And then from there, we can solve for x, y, and z to get our parametric equations, all right? If you're not familiar with symmetric and parametric equations of a line in 3D, be sure to check out my lesson video on lines in 3D. But with that, let's solve for x, y, and z in these equations. To solve for x in this equation, we need to first multiply both sides by two. So we'll have two t equals x minus one. Then for the y equation, we need to multiply both sides by 3. So we'll have 3t equals y plus 7. And then for this equation, where we want to solve for z, we can actually solve for it right away by just adding 3 to both sides of the equation. And that will give us that z equals t plus 3. All right, now let's finish off these two equations. We can solve for x and y by adding 1 to both sides of this equation and subtracting 7 from both sides of this equation. So we will have that x is equal to 2t plus 1, and y is equal to 3t minus 7. All right, and then we still have z equals t plus 3. Okay, and so now we have successfully found a set of parametric equations that represent this same line that was given to us as a symmetric equation. And so now we can go ahead and actually try to solve this problem now. We want to find any points of intersection between this line and this plane. So let's plug in each of these parametric equations, x, y, and z, into this plane equation and see if we can solve for that parameter of t. All right, so we'll have negative 7 times x, which is 2t plus 1. I got that from right here. That's what x is equal to. Then we will have plus 2y, so we'll have plus 2 times y, which is 3t minus 7. So we'll have 3t minus 7, and then we have plus 8 times z, and z is t plus 3. So we'll have t plus 3, and that will be equal to 3. All right, so now if we simplify, we want to multiply negative 7 by this quantity, we want to multiply 2 by this quantity, and multiply 8 by this quantity. So we will have negative 14t minus 7 plus 6t, minus 14 plus 8t plus 24, and that will be equal to 3. All right, and so now let's combine our like terms. We have three terms with t, negative 14t, positive 6t, and positive 8t, and negative 14t plus 6t is negative 8t, and so we'll have negative 8t plus 8t, which means that our t terms will cancel out to be 0, all right, so these three terms cancel out to become zero, and then we are just left over with these constant values equal to three. And so let's just combine those constants and see what we get here. We have negative seven and negative 14, that will become negative 21, and then negative 21 plus 24 will be positive three. So we're left with this equation, three equals three, which is a true statement, right? 3 is equal to 3. They're the same value. And so when this happens, when you are plugging in the parametric equations for a line into a plane and the t terms cancel out, there's two different things that could happen here and they mean two different things. The first thing that could happen is what happened right here where we have a true statement of 3 equals 3. When this happens, what that means is that every single point on this line is also on this plane. In other words, this line is contained within this plane. And so really there's an infinite number of points of intersection between this line and this plane. Every single point on the line is on this plane. All right, so that's what this means. But if we were instead to get an untrue statement or a false statement, let's say that we ended up with four equals three, right? This is not what happened. But if we had four equals three, that would not be true 
And when that occurs, that means that this line and this plane do not intersect at all. All right, and so you would say that there's no points of intersection between this line and this plane. But that's not what happened here. We did get a true statement, and so this line is contained within this plane. And so that's going to be our final answer. We will say that the line is in the plane. Okay, and so that's my final answer here. You could also write down that all points on the line are shared with the plane. However you want to say that is fine, but the bottom line is that this line is in this plane, and so they have an infinite number of points of intersection. Okay, and now for the second part of this problem, we have if they do intersect, find the angle of intersection. That's really only applicable when the line and the plane intersect at one point. Since the line is in the plane, there really is no angle of intersection. I guess technically the angle of intersection would be zero degrees or 180 degrees. All right, but that's kind of assumed if we know that the line is in the plane, so we don't really need to specify that angle of intersection. But do know that it's probably zero degrees or 180 degrees. Okay, but with that, that's it for this example. And so let's take a look at a different one. All right, so next up, we want to determine if the lines are parallel, intersect, or are skew. If they do intersect, find the point and angle of intersection. All right, and so this example is different than what we've done so far. In the previous two examples, we were looking at the intersection between a line and a plane, but now we're looking at the intersection of two lines, or at least we're trying to see if two lines do intersect or not. All right, and so you can see that we have two lines here represented by two different sets of parametric equations. And remember that in 3D space, there are three different ways that two lines could be related to each other or there's three different ways that they can interact. They can either be parallel, meaning they have the same direction and will never intersect. They could intersect at one point, or they could be skew, which means they're not parallel and they also don't intersect, all right? And so the way we go about this type of problem is we first check to see if the lines are parallel, and if they're not, then we see if they intersect, and if they don't intersect, then we know that they are skew, okay? And so that's how we're going to go about this problem. And so let's get started. Let's first determine if these two lines are parallel or not. And remember, to check if two lines are parallel, what you want to do is look at their direction vectors. If their direction vectors are parallel, then the lines are parallel. All right, and so what we actually end up doing is finding a direction vector for each line and seeing if those vectors are scalar multiples. Because if vectors are scalar multiples, then they're parallel. They have the same direction. And so let's find the direction vector for each line here. Remember that when you're given a line with a set of parametric equations, that a direction vector can be found by looking at the coefficients of the parameter in each parametric equation. All right, so for line one, the direction vector, vector v1 for that line, will have the components that are the coefficients of the parameter t1. And so if we're looking at our x equation, we have four as the coefficient of t1, and so four will be the x component, so we'll have four. And then for y, notice that we don't have a term with a parameter, so that would mean that the coefficient of the parameter is zero, so the y component here will be zero. And then for z, we have a coefficient of negative one for that parameter, so the z component is negative one. All right, and so if we do the same thing for line two, Vector v2 will be the direction vector for line two, and it will have components of two, two, and one. So we'll have two, two, one. All right, and so now by looking at these two vectors, can we conclude that they are scalar multiples? Are these two direction vectors parallel? Well, if you look at the signs of these components, I think it's pretty easy to quickly say, no, they're not scalar multiples. Because if you look at direction vector v1, we have two positive components and then a negative component. But then for direction vector v2, all three components are positive. So it's going to be impossible for us to pull out a scalar multiple or a scalar value from all of the components in either vector and end up with a vector that looks like the other vector. Another dead giveaway that that's the case is the fact that vector v1 has a component of zero for the y component and vector v2 does not. Whenever you have a zero for one component of a vector, but not for another, it's pretty impossible for them to be scalar multiples, okay? And so we know for a fact 
that vector v1 and vector v2 are not parallel. And so I'm just going to write that down here, not parallel. And so that means that these two lines are also not parallel. Okay, and so now there's two possibilities left. These two lines could intersect or they could be skew. And so what we have to do now is check to see if they intersect. And the way we do that is we set their corresponding parametric equations equal to each other. We'll set the x equations equal to each other, the y equations equal to each other, and the z equations equal to each other, and create a system of equations that we can then work with. And once we set up those equations, I will explain what our next step is. But let's just start by setting each of these equations equal to each other. All right, so we're gonna have an equation for x, y, and z. For x, we will have four times t1 plus two is equal to two times t2 plus two. For y, we will have three is equal to two times t2 plus three. And then for z, we will have negative t1 plus one is equal to t2 plus one, okay? And so now what we wanna do with these three equations is pick two of them to work with to solve for the parameters of t1 and t2. And then we're gonna check those values of t1 and t2 that we find in the third equation that we don't use, okay? And so let's get started on that process here. I'm going to choose to work with this equation for x and this equation for z, all right? So I'm gonna work with those two equations. And the way that I'm gonna go about solving for t1 and t2 is the method of elimination. We're combining our equations. And let me show you what I mean. First of all, let me write down our two equations. We have 4t1 plus 2 equals 2t2 plus 2. That's this equation right here. And then I'm going to write in this equation below it. We'll have negative t1 plus 1 equals t2 plus 1. And I'm going to use the method of elimination here. Notice that if we were to multiply this entire equation by 4, we would then have negative 4t1. And so if we combine these two equations, this 4t1 and this negative 4t1 would cancel out. That variable of t1 would be eliminated, allowing us to solve for t2, okay? Now, if you don't like this method of solving for these variables, you can use substitution. You could solve for t1 in this equation and then substitute what you get for t1 into this equation and then solve for t2. It doesn't matter. You can go about this however you'd like, but I'm gonna use the method of multiplying this equation by four and then combining the two equations to be able to solve for t2, all right? So if we multiply by four, I'm just gonna rewrite this equation. So we'll have four t1 plus two equals two t2 plus two. And then multiplying this equation by four will give us negative four t1 plus four equals four t2 plus four. And now what I'm going to do is combine those two equations and so we'll have 4t1 plus negative 4t1, that will be zero. Then we have two plus four, which is six. So we have zero plus six equals two times t2 plus four times t2, which is six t2. So we'll have six t2, and then we have two plus four, which is six. So we have plus six, all right? So we have six equals six t2 plus six. If we subtract six from both sides of the equation, we will have zero equals six times T2. And then dividing both sides by six will give us that T2 equals zero, all right? And so we know that T2 equals zero. And then using that value of T2, we wanna plug that back into one of those two equations that we worked with here and solve for T1. And so I'm gonna choose this second equation to work with here, our Z equation. We'll have negative T1 plus one equals t2 plus 1, but t2 is 0, so we'll have 0 plus 1. And then, if we simplify, we'll find that t1 is also equal to 0, because if you subtract 1 from both sides, these two 1s will cancel out, and then you have negative t1 equals 0, and so dividing both sides by negative 1 will give you that t1 equals 0. All right, and so by using these two equations, we were able to solve for t1 and t2. We found that they're both 0, and so now what we want to do is plug in those values of t1 and t2 into the third equation that we didn't use to find them and see if the equation holds true. 
If it does hold true, then our lines intersect, okay? And then we'll be able to find that point of intersection using those parameters. But now before we do that, I just wanna make it clear that you don't have to do this the same way that I'm doing it here. You don't have to pick the same two equations to work with to solve for T1 and T2. You could pick these two equations or these two. It doesn't matter. Just make sure that after you solve for T1 and T2 that you plug those values into the unused third equation. Whatever equation you didn't use to solve for them, you wanna plug those values into to check and see if your lines intersect. All right, you wanna see if those two lines share the same point for those values of T1 and T2 that you found. Okay, and so let's work on that here. I'm gonna plug in T2 equals zero and T1 equals zero into this third equation that I didn't use, the Y equation. And you'll notice that there's only a T2 in this equation anyway, so we don't really need to worry about T1. And so we will have three is equal to two times T2, which is zero, and then we have plus three. Now two times zero is zero, so that just becomes zero and we are left with three equal to three. And that is a true statement, which means that these two lines will intersect at a point, okay? In fact, we now know that the Y coordinate of that point is three, and we can find the X and Z coordinates by plugging in T1 and T2 into these two equations as well. But before we do that, I just wanna make it clear that if this statement was not true, if instead we got something like two equals three or one equals three, if the statement was false, then we would conclude that these two lines do not intersect and therefore are skew, all right? They wouldn't be parallel and they wouldn't intersect, so they would have to be skew lines, all right? But in this case, we did get a true statement, so these two lines do intersect. And so let's find that point of intersection. This is our y coordinate right here. And so I'm just going to write y here. So we remember that that's our y equation or our y coordinate. Now, if we plug these two values of t1 and t2 into our x and z equations, here's what we'll find. For x, we will have four times t1, but that's gonna become zero. So we'll have two equals two times t2, and t2 is zero, so we have zero plus two. So this term and this term become zero, so we just have two equals two, which means for x, we have an equation of two equals two. Then for z, we will have negative t1 plus one equals t2 plus one. Both t1 and t2 are zero, so we're gonna have zero plus one and zero plus one, which will give us one equals one. All right, and so for z, we have one equals one, which means that our z coordinate is one, just like this equation means that our x coordinate is two. All right, and so the point of intersection between these two lines we'll have the coordinates of two, three, one, all right? The X coordinate is two, the Y coordinate is three, and the Z coordinate is one. That is the point of intersection between these two lines. And so now that we found that point of intersection, we know that these two lines intersect. There's one more thing that we have to do here. Remember that this problem asks us to find the point and angle of intersection if they do intersect. So we have found the point, but we also wanna find the angle. And the angle of intersection between two lines will be the same as the angle between their direction vectors. And so we just have to use our formula for finding the angle between two vectors on these two direction vectors to find that angle of intersection. All right, and so let's do that real quick. To find the angle of intersection between these two lines, we need to set up the equation for finding the angle between two vectors. We'll have cosine of that angle theta is equal to the absolute value of the dot product between the two vectors. So we will have vector v1 dot vector v2, and that will be divided by their magnitudes multiplied together. So we have the magnitude of vector v1 multiplied by the magnitude of vector v2, all right? And so now let's set this up. Remember that the dot product of two vectors is just the sum of the product of corresponding components. So we'll have four times two plus zero times two plus negative one times one. And that will give us cosine of theta is equal to the absolute value of four times two, which is eight. So we'll have eight plus zero times two, which is zero. So we have eight plus zero plus negative one times one, which is negative one. And then in the denominator, we will have the magnitudes of these two vectors multiplied together. So we'll have the magnitude of vector v1 times the magnitude of vector v2. 
and the magnitude of a vector is equal to the square root of the sum of their components squared. So for vector v1, we'll have 4 squared plus 0 squared plus negative 1 squared. And so 4 squared is 16, 0 squared is 0, and negative 1 squared is positive 1. So we will have 16 plus 0, which doesn't change anything, plus 1. And then for vector v2, we'll have 2 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. 2 squared is 4, so we have 4 plus 4 plus 1 squared, which is 1. So we have 4 plus 4 plus 1. And so now if we simplify, we will have that cosine of theta, the angle of intersection, is equal to the absolute value of 8 plus 0 plus negative 1. 8 plus 0 is 8 plus negative 1 is 7. So we have the absolute value of 7, which is just 7. And then in the denominator, we have the square root of 16 plus 1, which is the square root of 17. And we're multiplying by the square root of 4 plus 4 plus 1, which is 9. And the square root of 9 is 3. So we have the square root of 17 times 3. All right. And so now to solve for theta, we take the inverse cosine of both sides of this equation. And doing so will give you that theta equals 55.5 degrees. That is the angle of intersection between these two lines. Okay, and I did round that off a little bit. There are some more decimals, but I rounded off the angle to one degree just to make it nice to look at. And so now we have both the point and the angle of intersection for these two lines. Let's take a look at another example. Hey there, real quick, before we take a look at the next example, if you find my tutorial videos here at JK Math to be helpful and you want access to more content such as exclusive bonus videos and dark mode versions of my videos, I'd invite you to check out my membership site, JK Math Plus, where all of that content is available. To learn how to join and see a full list of everything you'd get access to as a member, you can head over to jkmathematics.com plus. I'll have a link for that in the description of this video. Okay, so if you're interested in becoming a member, feel free to check that out. It's a great way to support me and the tutorials I make, as well as a great way for you to learn math better. But for now, let's get back to the video and take a look at the next example. All right, so next up we have a very similar example. Once again, we want to determine if the lines are parallel, intersect, or skew. If they do intersect, find the point and angle of intersection. All right, and so we have two different lines this time. Both of our lines are given to us in symmetric form. And so if we're going to determine if they intersect, we're going to want to find a set of parametric equations for each line. So we'll work on that then. But the first thing that we want to do here is check to see if these lines are parallel. And so we have to find a direction vector for each line. Now, when your lines are in symmetric form, it's pretty easy to quickly find the direction vector. The direction vector for each line will just be a vector with the components of the value in the denominator of each part of the symmetric equation. So for line one, vector v1, the direction vector for that line will have components of three, negative one, and one, right? Those are the values in the denominator of each part. Three, negative one, and then z plus one divided by one is essentially what this is right here. We don't really write divided by one because anything divided by one is itself. And so that denominator is one. And then for line two, that direction vector, vector v2, will have components of four, one, negative three. All right, those are the values in the denominator of each part. Four, y plus two would be divided by one. So we have one and then negative three. Okay, and so now looking at these two direction vectors, can you determine if they are parallel? Are they scalar multiples? And once again, hopefully just by looking at the signs of the components, you can pretty quickly see that they are not parallel. They are not scalar multiples. The signs of the components in both vectors either need to match up exactly or be the opposite of each other for there to even be a chance that they are scalar multiples. And in this case, for vector v1, we have positive, negative, positive. And so we would either need to have that for the components in vector v2 or the opposite, which would be negative, positive, negative. And we don't have that here, right? We have positive, positive, negative. And so it's going to be impossible to pull out a positive or negative constant value or scalar value from all the components in either vector and end up with a vector that looks like the other vector, all right? You're not gonna be able to show that these two vectors are scalar multiples based purely on the fact that the signs of their components do not match up, all right? Or they're not the opposite of each other either. 
okay? These two vectors have two different directions. They are not parallel. And so I'm gonna write that down here, not parallel, which means that these two lines either intersect or they're skew. And so let's see which it is. We need to determine if these two lines intersect or not. And in order to do that, we need to set their parametric equations equal to each other, the x, y, and z equations. But notice that we don't have them right now. We have these two lines in symmetric form, so we have to find those parametric equations, unfortunately. And so let's find them here. For line one, remember that each part of the symmetric equation would be set equal to that parameter of t. In this case, we're gonna say for line one that the parameter is t1. So we'll have t1 equals x divided by three, then t1 equals y minus two divided by negative one, and t1 equals z plus one. And then for line two, I'm gonna make the parameter t2. So we'll have t2 equals x minus one divided by four, t2 equals y plus two, and t2 equals z plus three divided by negative three. All right, so I just set each part of those symmetric equations equal to the parameter t1 or t2, depending on if we're working with line one or line two. And now what we have to do is solve for x, y, and z in each of those equations. All right, and so let's work on that next. I'm gonna solve for x, y, and z in these equations pretty quickly here. I'm hoping that by this point you're familiar with solving for variables using algebra. But for line one, we will have x equal to three times t1. We multiplied both sides by three. Then for y, we will have negative t1 plus two. We multiply both sides by negative one and then add two to both sides to solve for y. And then for z, we will have z equals t1 minus one. We subtract one from both sides of that equation. Now for line two, we will have x equals four times t2 plus one, right? We multiply four by both sides, so we have four times t2, and then we add one to both sides to solve for x, so we have four t2 plus one. And then for y, we will have t2 minus two. We just subtract two from both sides of the equation to solve for y. And then finally, we have z equals negative three t2 minus three. We multiply both sides by negative three, so we have negative three times t2, and then you subtract three from both sides to solve for z. So we have negative three, two t minus three. All right, so those are the set of parametric equations that will represent these two lines. And so now what we can do to determine if they intersect or not is set their corresponding parametric equations equal to each other. The x equations, the y equations, and the z equations. All right, and so let's do that next. If we set the x equations equal to each other, we'll have three t1, is equal to four t2 plus one. Then if we set the y equations equal to each other, we'll have negative t1 plus two is equal to t2 minus two. And then if we set the z equations equal to each other, we'll have positive t1 minus one is equal to negative three t2 minus three. All right, and so now what our next step is, is to pick two of these equations to use to solve for t1 and t2. And then once we solve for those two parameters, we wanna plug them back into the third unused equation and see if we get a true statement. All right, and so just by looking at these equations, I think I wanna work with this equation and this equation for y and z, because if we use the method of elimination to solve for t1 and t2, notice that we have a positive t1 and a negative t1. That'll work pretty nicely. We can combine those two equations and immediately eliminate that parameter of t1 and we'll be able to solve for t2. And so here's what I mean by that. We're gonna be working with these two equations and we're going to have negative t1 plus two equals t2 minus two. That's this equation right here. I just rewrote it. And then below it, I'm gonna rewrite this equation. So we have positive t1 minus one equals negative three t2 minus three. And now what I'm gonna do to solve for the parameters is combine these two equations and that will eliminate the parameter of t1 and allow us to solve for t2. Once again, you don't have to do it this way. You could also use substitution. You could solve for t1 in terms of t2 and then substitute that into the other equation and solve from there. But I think using this method of elimination is going to be a little bit quicker for this example. 
If we combine the like terms here, we have negative t1 and positive t1, which becomes zero. Then we have positive two minus one, which will give us plus one. And then that will be equal to t2 plus negative three t2, which will be negative two t2. And then we have negative two minus three, which will be negative five. All right, now, if we solve for t2, we wanna add five to both sides of the equation, and that will give us six equals negative two times t2. And then if we divide both sides by negative two, that will solve for t2. And doing so will tell us that t2 is equal to negative three. So t2 is negative three. Now let's plug that back into one of those two equations that we just used to find t1. And so I'm gonna choose this equation for y here. So I'm gonna have negative t1 plus two equals t2 minus two, but t2 we found is negative three. So we will have negative three minus two. So this will become negative t1 plus two equals negative five. And then if we subtract two from both sides of the equation, we have negative t1 equals negative seven. And so positive t1 equals positive seven. All right, so t1 is seven and t2 is negative three. That is what we found using these two equations. Now what we wanna do is plug those two values into that third unused equation, right? We did not use this equation for x to find those two values. We wanna plug those values into that equation and see if we get a true statement. If we work with our x equation here, we'll have three times t1 and t1 is seven. So we have three times seven will be equal to four times t2 plus one, and t2 is negative three. So we have four times negative three plus one. Three times seven is 21. Four times negative three is negative 12. So we have negative 12 plus one, and that gives us 21 equal to negative 11. And that is definitely not true. That is not a true statement. And so what that means is that these two lines do not intersect. They do not share any points, and so they are instead skew lines, all right? They're not parallel, and they don't intersect, so they must be skew. So the lines do not intersect, which means they are skew lines. That is the final answer to this example. And because the lines do not intersect, that means that there is no angle of intersection for us to find, and so we're done with this example. Okay, and so this was our last example of finding the intersection between two lines, but now we're going to look at one more example for this video where we find the intersection between two planes. All right, so for our last example, we wanna find a set of parametric equations for the line of intersection of the planes and find the angle between the two planes. All right, and so for this example, we're no longer working with any lines. We are working with two planes and we're told that these two planes intersect and we wanna find the line of intersection. All right, when two planes intersect, the intersection of those planes will be a line. All right, so unlike the intersection of two lines or the intersection of a line and a plane, the intersection of two planes is not a point, but it is a line, all right? And so our end goal in this problem is to find a set of parametric equations to represent that line where our planes intersect. And so in order to do that, remember that in order to represent a line in 3D, we need two things. We need a point on that line and we need a direction vector or a vector parallel to that line. And that's what we're gonna work on first, finding that direction vector. What we do to find a vector parallel to that line of intersection is we take the cross product of the normal vectors from the two planes. And the reason that works is because when you take the cross product of two vectors, the resulting vector from that cross product will be a vector that is perpendicular to both of the vectors involved in that cross product. All right, and so if we were to look at a normal vector from this plane and a normal vector from this plane, you could see that a vector that would be perpendicular to both of these normal vectors would have to be a vector that is in the same direction as the line of intersection for the two planes. All right, so you can see that this vector is perpendicular. It makes a right angle with both of those normal vectors. And so that's the cross product of these two vectors, and it's going to be parallel to the line of intersection for those planes. Okay, and so let's work on finding that direction vector 
what we have to do is first identify a normal vector for each of these planes. And that should be pretty simple. You can find a normal vector for each plane by looking at the coefficients of x, y, and z in each plane equation. Those coefficients will make up the components of a normal vector to that plane. So for plane one, which is 3x plus 2y minus z equals seven, a normal vector for that plane would look like this. We would have components of three, two, and negative one, right? Those are the coefficients of x, y, and z in this equation. And then for plane two, a normal vector for that plane, vector n2, would look something like this. We'll have a vector with components of one, negative four, and positive two. All right, those are the coefficients of x, y, and z. All right, and so these are the normal vectors that we're going to work with for these two planes. And if you didn't already know that these planes intersect, like we're told in this problem, what you would probably wanna do before you take the cross product of these two vectors is determine if they are parallel, because if the normal vectors are parallel or scalar multiples, then you can determine that the planes are parallel too, and that would mean that they don't intersect, and so there is no line of intersection. Okay, and if you did forget to check that for some reason, don't worry. When we go and take the cross product of these two vectors, if it turns out that these two vectors are parallel, the cross product will be equal to zero. And so you'll know right away if you get zero as your cross product that the normal vectors are parallel. And so therefore the planes would also be parallel. And so there would be no line of intersection for you to find, okay? But with that, let's find our direction vector for the line of intersection. I'm going to call it vector V. That vector will be equal to the cross product of the two normal vectors from our planes, vector n1 and vector n2. And so let's set up a three by three matrix to calculate this cross product. The first row will have the standard unit vectors i, j, and k. And then the second row will have the components of vector n1, and the third row will have the components of vector n2. So we'll have three, two, negative one, and then one, negative four, two. Okay, and then what we wanna do to calculate this cross product is start by looking at vector i. We're gonna cross out the row and the column that it's in and then calculate a two by two determinant using these four values. We'll have two times two, which is four, minus negative one times negative four, which is positive four. And so we have four minus four times i. Then we will subtract a two by two determinant multiplied by j and add a two by two determinant multiplied by k. And so let's look at j next. We'll cross out the row and the column that j is in and use the remaining four values to calculate a two by two determinant. So we'll have three times two, which is six, minus negative one times one, which is negative one. So we'll have six minus negative one. All right, and then finally, let's look at k. We'll cross out the row and the column that k is in and use these four values to calculate a two by two determinant. We'll have three times negative four, which is negative 12, minus two times one, which is two. And so we have negative 12 minus two. All right, now if we simplify, four minus four is zero. And so we'd have zero times i, which we really don't need to write. And so I'm just going to erase that. This just becomes zero. And then we have minus six minus negative one j. Six minus negative one will be the same as six plus one. So that would be seven, but then we have negative seven j we are subtracting that term. So we'll have negative 7j, and then we'll add that to negative 12 minus two times k, which will become negative 14k. And so we'll have plus negative 14k, or just minus 14k. All right, and so this right here is our cross product. It is the result of the cross product of the two normal vectors from our planes. And that vector is also a direction vector for the line of intersection for these two planes. All right, so we have a direction vector for that line. Now all we need is a point on that line. And then we can use that point and this direction vector in order to create a set of parametric equations for that line of intersection. And so how do we find a point on the line of intersection? Well, what we have to do is work with our plane equations these two equations together would form a system of equations where the solution to that system would be the intersection or the line of intersection 
between those two planes. All right, and so if we wanna find a point on that line of intersection, what we can do is set x, y, or z equal to zero in both of these equations, and that will allow us to find a point on that line of intersection where that line crosses through either the xy plane, xz plane, or yz plane. All right, that all depends on what variable you choose to set equal to zero. And so let me show you what I mean. For this example, I'm gonna to choose to let y equal zero. And so if we do that, our two plane equations will look like this. We'll have three x minus z equals seven and x plus two z equals zero. Okay, you'll notice that neither of these two equations have a term with y in them, and that's because we set y equal to zero. So this 2y became zero, and this negative 4y also became zero. So we just have 3x minus z equals seven, and then x plus 2z equals zero. All right, we have everything but those two y terms. And so now what we can do is we can solve for x and z, and since those are the two variables that are left in these equations, the point that we're going to find here with this y coordinate of zero and then whatever x, z coordinates we find, that coordinate point will be where the line of intersection for these two planes crosses through the x, z plane. All right, whatever two variables are left over is the plane where we will be finding a point that the line of intersection cuts through. All right, it's going to be a point on that line of intersection that we can then use with the direction vector to create a set of parametric equations. And so let's find that point. Let's solve for x and z in these two equations. What I'm going to do is solve for x and z using substitution. So I'm gonna solve for x here and subtract two z from both sides. That will give me that x is equal to negative two z and then I'll plug in negative two z in for x in this equation. And so we'll have three times x, which is now negative two z minus z equals seven. And that will become negative six z minus z equals seven because three times negative two z is negative six z. And then if we're subtracting another z from that, this will become negative seven z. And so I'm just going to rewrite that here we'll have negative seven z equals seven, and then dividing both sides by negative seven will give us that z is equal to negative one, all right? So that will be the z coordinate of the point on our line. We have the z coordinate of negative one and the y coordinate of zero, but then for the x coordinate, we can find that by plugging that value of z we found into this equation, which is basically the same thing as this equation, but slightly manipulated. And so if we plug in that value of z, we'll have x equals negative two times negative one, and negative two times negative one is positive two. And so we find that x equals two, all right? And so those three coordinates will make up a point on the line of intersection for these two planes. In particular, we found the point where the line cuts through the x, z plane because we set y equal to zero. And so that point on that line will be two, zero, negative one. The x coordinate is two, the y coordinate is zero, and the z coordinate is negative one. And so now we can use that point and the direction vector that we found earlier from the cross product of the two normal vectors to create a set of parametric equations to represent the line of intersection for these two planes. All right, now remember the general form for a set of parametric equations. You'll have x equals a times the parameter t plus x1, and then y equals b times the parameter t plus y1, and then z equals c times the parameter t plus z1, where a, b, and c are the direction numbers or the components of the direction vector the x component, y component, and z component, and x1, y1, and z1 are the coordinates from the point on that line, all right? So if we fill in everything here, notice that the x coordinate of our direction vector is zero. We don't have an i term, so the x component is just zero. And so we'll have x equals zero times t plus x1, which is the x coordinate from our point, which is two, so we'll have plus two and then y will be equal to negative seven t plus zero, right? Negative seven is the y component from the direction vector. It's the coefficient of j, and then we're adding the y coordinate of zero from our point, 
And then finally, we have z equals c times t, which will be negative 14t plus z1, which will be negative 1. All right, that's the z coordinate from our point, and then negative 14 is the z component from the direction vector. All right, now if we simplify, we'll have x equals 2, and then y equals negative 7t, and z equals negative 14t minus 1. All right, and so this right here is a set of parametric equations that represents the line of intersection between these two planes. Okay, and so that takes care of the first part of this example, but we still need to find the angle between the two planes, and the way we do that is by finding the angle between the normal vectors for those planes. Right, the angle between the normal vectors for two planes is the same as the angle between the two planes. And so once again, we need to pull out our formula for calculating the angle between two vectors. Remember that the formula for the angle between two vectors looks like this. We'll have cosine of that angle theta is equal to the absolute value of the dot product between the two vectors. So we'll have vector n1 dot vector n2 and then we divide by their magnitudes multiplied together. So we'll have the magnitude of vector n1 times the magnitude of vector n2. All right, and so let's calculate this. We'll have cosine of theta equals the absolute value of the dot product between these two vectors. So we're gonna be adding up the products of corresponding components. We'll have three times one, which is three. So we'll have three plus negative four times two, which is negative eight, and then we'll add that to two times negative one, which is negative two. All right, and then in the denominator, we need to multiply the magnitude of vector n1 by the magnitude of vector n2, and the magnitude of a vector is equal to the square root of the sum of its components squared, and so for vector n1, we'll have three squared plus two squared plus negative one squared. That will be nine plus four plus one right, three squared is nine, two squared is four, and negative one squared is one. And so nine plus four plus one is 14. So we'll have the square root of 14. And then for the magnitude of vector n2, we'll have one squared plus a negative four squared plus two squared. That will be one plus 16 plus four. One squared is one, negative four squared is 16, and two squared is four. And that will be equal to 21. And so we'll have the square root of 21 for the magnitude of vector n2. And then if we simplify, we'll have cosine of that angle theta is equal to the absolute value of 3 plus negative 8 plus negative 2. 3 plus negative 8 is negative 5 plus negative 2 is negative 7. But the absolute value of negative 7 will be positive 7. So we'll have 7 divided by the square root of 14 times the square root of 21, which will be the square root of 294. All right, and so if you take the inverse cosine of both sides of this equation, you'll be able to solve for theta, and doing so will give you that theta equals 65.9 degrees. All right, I did round that off to one decimal place, but that's approximately what the angle between the two planes will be. All right, it's the angle between the two normal vectors, which is also the angle between the two planes. And with that, this was the last example for this video, but if you do wanna see some more examples, I have a couple more available on my membership site. And so if that's something that interests you, feel free to look into becoming a member. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.